I'm going to talk about symmetry force rigidity. So I know this is review probably for most people here, but just in case it isn't, just we'll go through the very basics of rigidity theory. So a classical setup is you have a bar and joint framework, which is really just building a graph in D dimensions. So more precisely, you have a graph and then a function that just sends the vertices into RD. And such frameworks can be rigid or flexible, um, where you're treating your edges as incompressible rigid bars that are free to move around the vertex that they're attached to. So here are three examples in the plane, all on the same graph. Um, these th two are flexible, so that's easy to see with the square, right? You can sort of shear it. Um, but if I were to do something obnoxious and say put two of the vertices at the same point, then it becomes rigid. Um, I'm going to be talking about generic rigidity, so I'm going to assume that you don't do anything obnoxious like that. And if that's the case, then you know, as long as I'm as long as I choose this p function sufficiently generically, then whether or not the graph becomes rigid in d-dimensional space really only depends on the graph. All right, and I guess you know I'm talking about local rigidity here. Um, so here's an example: if I take you know this four cycle with a chord and stick it in two dimensions, then as long as I'm not doing anything to um, you know, trying to break things as long as I don't like put, for example, these two vertices on top of each other, this is always going to be rigid. All right. Um, so yeah, classical rigidity theory, the most basic question is which graphs are minimally generically rigid in RD. Um, you know, in R1, this is an easy characterization, minimally generically rigid graphs are trees. Um, and of course, there's this well known theorem of um, Polachek and Polachek Geiringer. Um, Lamont's theorem in two dimensions, which just gives this uh, necessary and sufficient condition for a graph to be minimally generically rigid in R2. Um, so where I'm going with this talk is I want to take this story and talk about it for frameworks that are forced to have some kind of symmetry. Um, and I'll, I'll go through a history of this after this. Um, you know, this has been, um, you know, I, I guess considered going back to like 2010, I think. Um, but anyway, the setup is as follows. Um, in symmetry force rigidity, uh, you only care about flexes of the framework that preserve symmetry. So here, for example, is a framework in two dimensions. It has symmetry with respect to the wallpaper group uh, that has you know, translations um, in two dimensions. And it also has a fourfold rotation. And it's symmetry force flexible, I claim. Um, and what that means is that there is a way to deform this framework so that the symmetry is preserved at every point in that deformation. And I, I have a video here um, showing this. There we go. Um, so yeah, notice the here's a flex of the framework. And at every point in this little animation, um, the framework still has the same symmetry. OK, and so the goal here now is to characterize generic symmetry force rigidity in RD. And I'll, I'll define what I mean by this. Um, but before I can do that, I need a um, compact way to talk about frameworks that have symmetry and graphs that have symmetry. And um, you know, it's, it's been noticed by a handful of different authors that maybe the most compact way to do this is with something from, I think, topological graph theories where it or originated, um, something called a gain graph. And what a gain graph is, is it's just a directed multigraph whose arcs are labeled by the elements of some group. Um, and now, here's what I mean. Here's the formal definition of uh, what it means for a graph to have symmetry with respect to some group. Um, so either you know the definition and this is, you just know it and there's, there's no point in reading it or you don't and this is going to be confusing. So let's just look at an example. Um, this graph in the lower left, it has symmetry with respect to, for example, um, the cyclic group of order four. And that just reflects the fact that if you were to rotate this graph 90 degrees counterclockwise, it would look the same. Um, now, because of this, I can actually, knowing this, I can represent this a little bit more compactly with a gain graph. So um, 
you know, which is again, just a directed multigraph whose arcs are labeled by elements of some group. Um, in this case, the group is gonna be the symmetry group of this graph here. And, um, you know, the, the way to go between a gain graph and a symmetric graph is, is not particularly difficult, but it's, it's messy. So I'll just, you know, hopefully um, get everyone to understand this example. But the way it works is that your vertices of the gain graph are going to be in bijection with the vertex orbits of the um, symmetric graph, right? So since you have the cyclic group of order four acting on this graph, um, every vertex is in some orbit. Those orbits are represented by single vertices in the gain graph. And um, the edges, or sorry, the arcs of the gain graph correspond to edge orbits in the symmetric graph. So now in this, and, and, and um, in order to, um, so I, I, okay, I guess it's clear, I guess, hopefully how um, the vertices of this correspond to vertex orbits of this. So the black vertex orbit here is the black vertex here. The white vertex orbit is the, sorry, yeah, the white vertex orbit is the white vertex here. Um, and to get the arcs on this, what I'm going to do is I first need to pick some representative of each orbit in the symmetric graph. So um, here I'm picking this upper right vertex um, as a representative from the black vertex orbit and this lower left vertex as a representative from the white orbit. And once I do that, um, note that if I were to say apply the group element that is a 180 degree rotation to this white vertex, it would lie at this, which is then adjacent to the representative of the black vertex. And in my gain graph, this is reflected by having this arc labeled by A squared. In other words, the group element that takes this white, uh, the representative of the white orbit to something adjacent to the representative of the black orbit. And okay, I can also have um, edges that connect vertices within a single orbit, and that's that's why we have self loops here. Um, so, are there any questions about? Yeah, I should say at any point, please feel free to unmute yourself and just interrupt, or you can write in the chat if you're more um, comfortable. I will try to pay attention to the chat. Um, okay, so so given this setup. Um, you can ask the question, for each dimension D and each subgroup S of Euclidean isometries of RD, characterize the S gain graphs that are minimally generically rigid. Um, and so by, by, by generic, I basically mean like if you are to fix the position of something in each vertex orbit, well, when you apply symmetry, that gives you positions for everything in the framework. Um, so you can really ask, like, even though there is symmetry here, you can actually ask about like generic rigidity. Um, and so this has been a problem that has been thought about going back to, you know, at least 2010. Um, as far as I know, the first sort of papers um, looking at this in, in a sort of rigorous way um, were um, one paper of uh, Schulze and Whiteley um, talking about um, the case of finite groups, um, and then another paper of um, Borcha and Strenu in 2010, focusing more on the case of um, having a, having lattice symmetries. Um, and you know, and since then there was this sort of um, flurry of activity trying to sort of solve this problem in as many specific instances as possible. Um, yeah, so independently, um, Malsing and Thoran in 2013, and um, Ross in 2015. Uh, we're able to characterize rigidity for two-dimensional lattices. Um, so uh, Malsin and Theran's result has a little bit more flexibility. They allow the um, representation of the lattice to vary. Um, Ross in 2015 solved the generic um, symmetry force rigidity problem for three-dimensional body bar frameworks. Um, the case of all rotation groups and odd dihedral groups was done again independently by Malsing and Thuran and um, Jordan Kazanitsky and Tanigawa. Um, and then also a paper of 2015 of Malsing and Thuran uh, characterizes generic symmetry force rigidity in the case um, 
for wallpaper groups with flexible lattices. So I'm going to talk about a recent result of mine um, from that basically generalizes a handful of things in here. Um, and what sort of excites me the most about it more than anything is, is, is the proof technique, which uses tropical geometry. Um, so yeah, I'm going to tell you what that result is. Um, I need to introduce a few definitions before I can do that. So um, within a uh, gain graph, some of the more important for various applications combinatorial data that you get from it is in what's known as balanced cycles. So um, here are the sort of the relevant definitions. So if you have a walk in a gain graph, um, the gain of that walk is just the product of the labels in it inverting whenever you traverse an arc backwards. So for example, um, if I were to go around this four cycle along the outside, maybe starting from here, um, but not closing it up um, clockwise, the resulting gain of that walk would be A times A inverse times R. So the gain of that walk would be R. I'll say that a cycle is balanced if the gain of any walk around that cycle is the identity. So for instance, if I were to close that walk up and go all the way around that cycle, the gain would be A, A inverse R, R inverse, which is the identity. So that cycle is balanced. Um, sort of implicit in that definition there is the claim that it doesn't matter which vertex I start at. Um, so we can see that in this example, say, if I start here and go around, I'll get A inverse R, R inverse A, which is also the identity. Um, so this is a sensible definition, um, I claim. Um, yeah, and just to see sort of a, a non-balanced cycle, right? If I were to take this three cycle here, and if I were to go around starting at this vertex in the clockwise direction, I would get A R inverse R, which is not the identity. If I were to start here and go around, I would get R R inverse A, which is different, which, which is A, which is a different group element, but it's also not the identity. Um, okay, so that's what it means for a cycle to be balanced. Um, and then two other definitions I need are as follows. So a bicyclic graph is a subdivision of one of these three graphs. And a bicyclic gain graph is Dutch if each pair of closed walks based at the same vertex have gains that commute. Um, and just the reason why I, I, I pick the term Dutch is because some authors call bicyclic graphs bicycles, but it's spelled bicycle. And in the US at least, um, bicycles that are designed specifically for commuting are often called Dutch. So a bicycle that commutes is Dutch. Um, and then the other definition I need is that of a complete gain graph. So given a group S, the complete gain graph um, case of N of S, it just has vertex at one through N, and it's gonna have an arc between every pair of vertices for each element of the group. Um, and it's gonna have a loop at every vertex for each non-identity element. So here's maybe the simplest interesting example. This is K2 of Z2. It has two vertices and a arc between them for each element of Z2. And it's gonna have a loop at each vertex for the one non-identity element of Z2. So with all that in mind, here's, here's, the, here's the theorem. Um, let S be a subgroup of the semi-direct product of R2 and SO2. So these are just Euclidean isometries that are orientation preserving. So in other words, I just don't allow reflections in my group. Um, then for each S gain graph H, I'm gonna define alpha of H to be three if every cycle in H is balanced, two if not, and the gain of each cycle is a translation, one, if none of the above and all bicyclic subgraphs are Dutch and zero otherwise. Then um, G is minimally generically infinitesimally rigid in R2 if and only if the number of edges is twice the number of vertices minus alpha of the complete gain graph on that vertex set. And for all subgraphs G prime of G, I, I get this inequality. So this you know looks a lot like Lamont's theorem or like a Maxwell kind of count, except instead of 
you know, 2v minus 3, I have 2v minus some function that depends on the game labels. Um, so, you know, since, since open problems was specified in, um, in, the, in the title of this workshop, I, I should um, mention, I guess, two, two things to do next from this. So um, based on Walter's um, talk yesterday, I think it might actually be pretty easy to turn into um, a result about rigidity on any orientable surface. I need to think about this a little more and maybe talk to someone who knows the relevant like classical topology stuff. But um, yeah, if you were at Walter's talk yesterday, um, among other things, he said that if you have a metric that is projectively equivalent to the Euclidean metric, then basically rigidity theory or on the infinitesimal level is invariant. Um, and so, you know, if you were to take this result and say, you know, for um, the, the group consisting of an eightfold rotation and then, you know, a two dimensional lattice. Okay, so in the Euclidean plane, this group is a mess. It, it doesn't really have a, you know, it, it can have infinitesimally small um, uh, translation vectors. But if you take that same group in the hyperbolic plane, um, then, you know, it, it, I guess it looks better. Um, but in particular, you can take an octagon in it um, and sort of identify opposite edges. And that gives you, if you fold it up like that, the two torus. So, you know, assuming things sort of work well, you know, maybe you can use this to get, this just gives you, you know, like whatever Lamont's theorem should be on a torus with two holes um, in the intrinsic metric. I don't know if this is of interest to anybody, but it seems like sort of an easy consequence assuming things that I think should work out will work out. Um, but anyway, and then the other, the other thing um, to do with this next is to extend the proof technique to accommodate reflections. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the proof of this in, in the rest of the talk, and I'll show you precisely where the proof breaks down for, um, you know, if, if you allow orientation re reversing um, group elements. Um, and you know, if you, if you try to allow reflections, it makes things harder, but not completely hopeless, at least it seems right now. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, yeah. But yeah, are, are there any questions about, about the theorem or anything um, before I go on to talking about its proof? All right, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip the example. I don't actually think that's that enlightening. Um, here, here's, here's the broad outline of the proof. So I like to think about rigidity in terms of matroids. And so asymmetry forced rigid graphs are the spanning sets in the algebraic matroid of something I call the asymmetric Cayley Menger variety. I'll define this later, but it's sort of this, you know, symmetry forced analog of the Cayley Menger variety, which I will also define later. Um, but anyway, when S doesn't contain reflections, then this variety is a Hadamard product of affine spaces. Again, I'll define what a Hadamard product is later, um, but it's, 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 a, it's a nice way to sort of take two varieties and stick them together in some way. Um, and then each affine space, it defines two matroids, one of which is an elementary lift of each other. And given this, I can describe the algebraic matroid of a Hadamard product of affine spaces in terms of these two matroids for each. And the proof of this uses tropical geometry. Um, and then once I have this formula for just, you know, the algebraic matroid of an arbitrary product of affine spaces, I can just apply it into the setting and that theorem just falls out. Um, yeah. So let's uh, start defining some terms here. So um, I'm going to use this notation c to the e to denote the complex vector space whose coordinates are indexed by the elements in some set e. So e is a set. Um, in this case, every subset of e, it defines a coordinate projection onto those coordinates. Now, given an irreducible variety, a given subset of coordinates is going to be independent if the dimension of the projection onto those coordinates of the variety v um, has dimension equal to the cardinality of S. So in other words, 
Your independent sets now correspond to projections that give you something full dimensional when you restrict it just to the variety. A set of coordinates is going to be spanning if the dimension of the projection is equal to the dimension of the original variety. And this set will be called a basis if it's both independent and spanning. And then the common and combinatorial, the structure described by any one of these three set systems is what's called the algebraic matroid of V. Now, here's an example. If E is, say, the entries of a three by three matrix, and V is the um, variety of three by three matrices of rank one, um, then if I let S be this set of coordinates, I claim that S is spanning, but not independent. So to see that it's not independent, well, OK, this, this is a set of coordinates I'm projecting onto. It's not independent because this 2 by 2 minor has to be 0. And in particular, um, the projection has to satisfy an equation. So it's not going to be full dimensional um, in this image space. And then to see that it's spanning, well, I claim that the variety of 3 by 3 matrices of rank at most 1 has dimension 5. Um, but as you can see, there are six coordinates here and one equation. So this image under the projection also has dimension five, right? So, so this projection, its dimension is the same as the dimension of the original variety. Is there any questions? All right, so this is maybe a review to the people in the audience who like thinking about um, rigidity theory in terms of algebraic geometry. Um, and for the rest of the audience, um, so given a pair of integers d and n, the Cayley Menger variety of n points in our d, um, denoted like this, is the affine variety embedded in c to the n choose 2 as the Zariski closure of the set of possible pairwise Euclidean distances between n points in our d. So just for a concrete example, right, this is just, um, so for d equals 2, say, right, um, if you pick n points in R2, and then you look at all of the pairwise distances um, among them, then this gives you one point in the Cayley Menger variety. And then now, if you sort of do this for every set of endpoints in R2, this sweeps out some set in R, uh, sorry, in um, R to the n choose two. And then you can just take its Zariski closure in C to the n choose two, and this gives you some variety, which is called the Cayley Menger variety. And now, given this, a graph I claim is generically minimally rigid, or sorry, generically rigid in R D, if and only if E is spanning in the Cayley Menger variety. Um, and sort of just you know the the way to see this is to note that um, a spanning set, so a set S is spanning if the corresponding coordinate projection preserves dimension, but that also means that your fibers of this projection. Um, you know, the inverse image of a single point is zero dimensional. In other words, just a finite set of points. Now, a flex of your graph corresponds to, you know, within a single point in this projection, a bunch of stuff sort of like in the fiber, in the unprojected space, um, that contains a curve. And that curve upstairs is the flex. So if your projection is zero dimensional, sorry, if you're fibers are zero dimensional, there's no curves in there. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's, if you haven't seen this before, that's, that's why this is true vaguely. Um, so I'm also gonna, just to um, talk about all the, the, the proof of, of, of this result here, I'm gonna need to be able to talk about um, matroids in general. So um, here's the definition of a matroid. It's just a pair consisting of this set E, often called the ground set, and then a subset of sets that are independent. And then there are three combinatorial axioms they can satisfy. Either you've seen this and this is review and unhelpful, or you haven't seen this and it's at least a third axiom is maybe going to be too much to digest in, in 30 seconds. Um, so a matroid, it just consists of a ground set and then a collection of sets that you just say are independent and they satisfy some axioms and you know examples include the algebraic matroid of an irreducible variety. Um, given a matroid, the rank function 
is just the function from the set of subsets of your ground set to the positive integers or non-negative integers that maps a set to the cardinality of the largest independent subset of it. And a spanning set of a matroid is just a set of maximum rank and a basis is a spanning independent set. So this is, this is just sort of a combinatorial abstraction of this definition of algebraic matroid I had two slides ago. And the reason that I introduced this in general is to tell you about a construction of Edmonds that I'm gonna use, um, or it might actually be Edmonds and Rhoda. Um, but anyway, if I have a function, um, a set function that is increasing n submodular, in other words, satisfies these two axioms, um, then I will define this matroid M of F to be the matroid on ground set E, where I is independent if and only if for all subsets, either that subset is empty or its cardinality is bounded above by this function F. So sort of the, the important thing to get from here is, you know, you give me a set function satisfying two axioms, whatever they are, um, you know, I claim that that defines a matroid in this way where your independent sets are the sets whose cardinality is bounded above F's value on them. Um, so I'll give you a rigidity theoretic reason to care about this in a minute, but um, if you like matroids, then um, it turns out that the matroid union of, you know, a set of matroids is an example of this. If you just take the sum of the rank functions of D different matroids, and then do this construction on it, the resulting matroid that gets spit out is the union. But here's why you should care about it from a rigidity theoretic perspective. Um, so I guess, okay, jumping right down to the bottom and then I'll, I'll go back. So um, this you know, big result of Lovash and Yamini in 1982 um, can be more succinctly phrased as follows. So if R is the rank function of the graphic matroid underlying Kn, then this matroid you get from the function twice that minus one um, is the algebraic matroid underlying the Cayley Menger variety of endpoints in R2, or in other words, it's the rigidity matroid in two dimensions. Um, and here's why, at least from a geometric perspective. So Lovash and Yamini have a, have a more combinatorial proof, but from a geometric perspective, um, the Hadamard product of two points um, in F to the E is just the point you get by just multiplying um, corresponding coordinates together, right? So if this is just like the Minkowski sum of two points, except instead of adding things, you're multiplying them. Um, and then the Hadamard product of two varieties is just, well, take every pair of points in your two varieties, take the Hadamard product of those two points, and then take the Zariski closure of the set of points you get from this. Um, so this is the Hadamard product of these two varieties. So here's a theorem. If U and V um, are linear spaces, then the algebraic matroid of the Hadamard product of them is just um, the matroid you get using that construction of Edmonds and Rhoda, um, where your function is just the sum of the two rank functions minus one. And okay, why, why this is relevant for rigidity theory is because it turns out that the Cayley Menger variety of endpoints in R2 is the Hadamard product of two copies of this linear space U, um, where U is the linear space spanned by the incidence matrix of the complete graph on N vertices. And from these two together, this result of Lovash and Yamini falls out. Um, are there any questions? All right. Okay. So now, now that hopefully um, this makes some sense, I hope for uh, the Cayley Menger variety case or, or non-symmetry force rigidity, I'm gonna I'm gonna ratchet up the complexity a little bit and talk about how this applies in the symmetry force setting. Okay. So now, as before, um, S is just gonna be a group of Euclidean isometries of R D. Um, I'm going to use this notation. So for a field F, F to the K N of S is just going to be the vector space with coordinates indexed by arcs of um, K N S. So note um, that if S is um, infinite, then this is going to be an infinite dimensional space. Um, so 
I'm going to define now the analog of this map that, so, so in the non-symmetric case, right, you just have a set of endpoints in RD and you map it to all the pairwise distances between them. Here, I'm going to have a map that takes, again, endpoints in RD, but it's not just going to map, it's going to give me more than just the pairwise distances between every pair of them. Um, it's going to, you know, for every pair of points and then every group element, it's going to take one of those points, apply the group element to it, and then give me the pairwise distances between those two points. Um, so this includes all the pairwise distances, but then also, you know, pairwise distances, you know, uh, more, more than that, distances between a point and then the group, a, a group element applied to each other point. Um, and then as before, I'm going to define this CM, CM sub n of s to be this risky closure of the image of D. Um, and you know, it turns out that an S gain graph G is generically infinitesimally rigid if and only if it corresponds to a spanning set in this Kaley Menger variety. And for basically the same reason as before, um, you know, and I, 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 um, I will say things are a, I, a little bit more complicated here, right? Because you can potentially have infinite dimensional, or you, you can potentially live in an infinite dimensional space. Um, these varieties are finite dimensional. So a lot of algebraic geometry still works, but there are potentially complicating things that arise. Um, but anyway, uh, let me just give you an example of this construction. Um, here, if S is just the group generated by this 180 degree rotation, um, and I'm only dealing with two points, then the resulting Cayley Menger variety looks like this. So here, is the coordinate corresponding to that one pair of points and then the identity element. So this corresponds to this arc and it's just the distance between those two points. This is the distance between the point x1, y1 and then the point I get by applying a to it. Um, and then this is the point I get, or sorry, yeah, th th this, um, this coordinate corresponds to this arc and it's what I get when I look at the distance between x1, y1, and then x2, y2 after applying a to it. And then finally, this coordinate corresponds to this arc. And it's the distance between the point x2, y2, and then the point I get by applying a to it. Um, OK, so now. In the d equals two case, in the case where s is a subgroup of um, the orientation preserving isometries, then I can express gains as follows. So there will be a translation part and then a rotation part. Um, and you know, if it's a rotation of angle theta, um, the matrix is going to look like this. And if I do this, then under this change of parameters, then the entry of this variety corresponding to some arc E is going to look like this. So sort of the important thing to take away from this is that this is an affine function of X and Y, uh, sorry, uh, of your X coordinates. This is an affine function of your Y coordinates. Um, and well, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this tells you that um, this variety is a Hadamard product of affine spaces. Um, and now this is precisely the part that breaks down when you try to allow reflections. What happens is your X, so, so like what's really nice here is your X coordinates and Y coordinates just get completely separated across this Hadamard product. Um, but when you allow reflections, they start to mix. And so it's no longer a Hadamard product, but it still just is a product of affine forms. Um, so not all hope is lost, but it is more complicated. Um, but anyway, so now this, this, this raises the question, well, what is the algebraic matroid of a Hadamard product of affine spaces? Um, and I'll tell you. So if V is this affine space, so it's, I'm, I'm going to think about an affine space is just the range of a matrix plus some constant vector. The algebraic matroid of this affine space, just thought of as a variety, is just going to be the row matroid of A. Um, now, if I define m to the L of e 
to be the rho matroid of this augmented matrix, um, then m to the L of v is an elementary lift of mv. So um, this is elementary lifts are, are you know, a construction in matroid theory. Um, but if, if you don't, uh, the, 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 you know, if you haven't seen it before, that's fine. The sort of important feature of lifts is that this tells me now that if I is independent in this matroid, then it's also independent in the lifted matroid. Now, and here, here's, here's sort of like the general form of the theorem just for Hadamard products of affine spaces. If U and V are finite dimensional affine spaces, um, then I'm going to define this function F to be the sum of the rank functions if the rank, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, F of a given S is going to be the sum of the ranks of S in uh, the matroids of each of those affine spaces if the rank of one of them increases when you go to this lift, right? So if your rank, if your rank of S in either um, U or V is bigger in ML than it is in M, then it's gonna be the sum. And otherwise it's gonna be the sum minus one. Um, so, okay, this is some function. It turns out it's submodular, it's increasing. Um, so I can you know, use that construction of Edmonds and Rhoda to define a matroid from it. And it turns out um, that the matroid defined by this function is the algebraic matroid of this Hadamard product. Um, so yeah, and then, and then where I'm going from here, I, I'm almost done. Um, I just need now to apply this to uh, this particular example, the, these symmetric kegley menger varieties. Um, so another community besides topological graph theorists that care about um, gain graphs are matroid theorists. And um, I think this definition goes to uh, Zaslavsky. Um, but it says that the gain graphic matroid of a gain graph G is the matroid supported on the arc set of G whose independent sets are sets of arcs such that each connected component has at most one cycle, which is not balanced. Um, so if I were to, so yeah, if, if I were to look at this graph, say, um, the bases of it are just going to be spanning trees um, plus either a loop or, or yeah, just this loop, right? So um, yeah, if I were to take, yeah, so, so the gain of this particular cycle, that loop is not balanced. So if I were to take, you know, say these three arcs and then that loop, I would get a basis. Uh, but I would not get a basis, say, if I were to take, um, just like the four cycle, um, because the gain of the four cycle is the identity. In particular, that's a balanced cycle. Um, and then, okay, now that I have this, I can sort of put things all together. So um, now if S is an orientation preserving subgroup of Euclidean isometries on the plane, the corresponding kaylee menger variety is a Hadamard product of affine spaces where um, there, there are different affine spaces, but they have the same matroids. Um, in particular, the matroids of each is just the gain graphic matroid of the gain graph obtained from um, the complete gain graph just by ignoring tr the translation part of each gain. And the corresponding lifts that I described earlier is obtained from the gain graph um, just by, or sorry, the, the gain graphic matroid of this just by making, by asserting that non-Dutch bicyclic subgraphs are independent. All right, and then putting that all together, this theorem just falls out, right? So um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess this is, this is, yeah, if you're interested, you can piece this together either from the slides or, or, or from the paper, um, but it, it really does just sort of fall out. Um, yeah, and I guess I'll end a little early. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Daniel. So are, are there any questions for Daniel? So I, I like the explanation of Dutch. I had wondered last time I heard you talk about <laughs> similar, but it's, it was good to know.
Nice. Do, do they call bicycles Dutch in other, or commuting bicycles Dutch in other countries, or is that just an American thing? I hadn't heard that before. Okay. Oh, oh, Walter? So, D Daniel, yesterday I talked a little bit about the projective transformations in the plane that take half turns to mirror symmetry and vice versa. So that's really working in the symmetries of the elliptic space, the projective, elliptic model of projective space, where you are able to switch the orientations and so on. How does, is, that kind of correspondence transfer into your methods at all? So you don't, you're no longer saying mirrors are really different than rotations because they're interchangeable in the plane. In three space, what it, what's interchangeable is a mirror and an inversion about a point. And you get similar kinds of pairings all the way up. So. Yeah. I, so yeah, I can I can see how that sort of like the the I can see how that probably manifests itself in this setting. Um, yeah, so I'll go back to you know like in um, uh, where is it? Ah, over here. Okay. So so the thing that that makes things difficult when you start bringing in reflections is so here I have you know s source minus e to the i theta x target and same for y. Um, what winds up getting messed up is if you, you know, if, um, yeah, okay, so yeah, I should say, okay, this is sort of like the expression for a point at the coordinate corresponding to a particular arc. So this is what it looks like if that arc has a group label that's orientation preserving. If that arc is orientation reversing, then this x target e and y target e switch which doesn't matter if you don't have any reflection part in the sense that like, well, you can just switch the roles of X and Y in a certain way, and then things will not be changed, at least on a matroid level. I think I have to think about that a little bit more, but I, I think that's how that, what you're saying would manifest here. But then I'll also say it doesn't really like help for more complicated things because when you start putting, you know, reflections and rotations together, that's, I mean, unless there's like some kind of projective way to get around that. Well, the way would be the on this on the sphere on the sphere with antipodal points identified that that there's it might at some point be worth looking at the chapter in Conway's book on uh, what was it called Octonians and. I'm not coming up with the full title, but he had a whole Quaternions? chapter. What? It was Quaternions and Octonians? Yes. Sorry, um, Quaternions and... I'm writing this down. Conway, Quaternions and Octonians? I think so. I think so. Okay. But it's, so that's what Barrett and Tony and I and Kate were using for this, exploring a particular example of the pairing, but I hadn't really thought a lot about whether that pairing takes force. I think it takes force symmetry to force symmetry, but Berndt might be able to answer that. Let me make one comment. You At times you were saying Edmonds and Rhoda and Edmonds. My understanding of the history is Edmonds and Rhoda published an abstract with that statement in it, and Edmonds published the proof. <laughs> OK. <laughs> It, so. <laughs> it is Edmonds Rode in some sense. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah, because I've never been able to find that Edmonds and Rode thing. Um, it's an abstract only. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, okay. All right. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> um, there's a question in the chat. What are the applications that you can envision re chirality of atomic structure of amino acids? Um. So yeah, I, I, I don't really know. Um, I sort of came at this from the perspective of like the, I, I, I know, I, you know, this, um, I had this tool for 
looking at varieties of Hadamard products of linear spaces. And I basically just searched the rigidity theory literature to find some kind of thing that could fit that mold. And it seemed like other people had thought about this. Um, I, it seems like the applications come from um, material science and in particular, a type of material called, I think a zeolite, but I don't really know yeah, I, I don't. I don't really know much. I can't really say much about the applications, and I'm sure there are other people in here who could maybe. Um, I can yeah. say a little bit. We there is. We looked at some at the symmetry questions for biomolecules and quest and so on. So, for example, take a current example: the spike protein of the coronavirus is a trimer, three, identic, three copies of an identical protein twisted together. And so that's likely to have threefold symmetry. <laughs> oh, cool. I'm giving a job talk in a week. I'm going to mention that. <laughs> um, I could, I, this is stuff I got from Adnan Shloka, who's doing a lot of protein related stuff. But, but I don't, I don't think the chirality in the backbone of proteins and so on immediately fits into that. Um, there's a bunch of history and errors in databases and so on about what's chiral and what's left-handed and right-handed up, up the backbone of a protein. They, they, it, their algorithms introduce systematic errors that uh, Un underestimated how many swaps things are. So I don't think it's immediately similar. We, there is a paper that Adnan and Berent and I published on the question of does, does symmetry in a protein make a difference to its flexibility and its rigidity and so on. And it's a fairly superficial at the sense that in detail, some of the symmetry is not quite there, <laughs> right? The common situation is that you got a protein, you have a protein produced by two, two, two copy, identical copies of the protein. It's likely to hitch up with uh, two-fold symmetry, uh, you know, but there can be small variations that turn out to make a lot of difference in function and so on. But there, there is a paper you can look at just for, for if you're interested. And of course, the talk this morning showed uh, the, the, carbon, the carbon rings, uh, six-fold ring of carbon, where two different symmetries in the ring produce two different um, experiences. So um, the, boat in the boat in the chair you can look for in the rings. It appeared in the motivational stuff of the first talk this morning. <laughs> 